while they're heading out, while they're heading out, I'm going to jump in with this today. So we got to talk, church. We got to talk. We have got to talk. Some things in life just don't make sense. They just don't make sense. My wife the other day said to me, have fun, be safe. And I was like, which one is it? (laughs) It doesn't make any sense. Do I have fun or do I be safe? I don't, it's impossible. It's a paradox that she's given me. Here's another one that doesn't make any sense. So your best friend comes to you and he says, hey, are you up for going to a movie? And you say, yeah, I'm down. Think about this. Being up to something and being down for something equates to the same exact thing. It doesn't make any sense. That's confusing. How about this one? This is a personal favorite. Your body has a lot of bones. How many bones does your body have? Somebody smart. 206. Okay. 206 bones. Um, Your bones can do something interesting, Mom. Did you know that? They they can heal themselves. They really can. They can, sort of, they do it weird, but they, they can heal themselves. Even the little tiny ones, they can heal themselves. 206 bones. But you only have a few teeth. Only a few teeth. And they can get a cavity that's less than a millimeter. And your teeth can do nothing about it. (laughs) You go to the dentist and they're like, no, we have to put something in there. They can't fix this. It doesn't make any sense. Amen? It frustrates me. I'm like, I just want my teeth to regenerate, Rick. (laughs) I do. Although I've been watching my baby, like, teething right now. It does not look fun. He's really cranky. It's bad. But I just wish they could. I mean, it doesn't make any sense. It, It doesn't make any sense. Here's something, here's something from like the natural world, all right, and animals. Who knows what a platypus is? Yeah, uh, platypus doesn't make any sense. <laughs> that animal makes no sense. I want you to think about this, because it, it seems like, it seems like God is getting to the end of the creation days, or however that played out, and he's got his bin, and he's like, <laughs> all right. What do we got, Michael? Come on, bring it on over. He's, well, we got a duck bill. We got these swimmy claw things, and like it looks kind of like a, an otter body, maybe, and a bushy tail, and there's some venom, but only in the back legs. You got some venom. And we ran out of stomachs. I meant to tell you before, but the cows took a bunch of them. So we're like, <laughs> did you know that? Platypus doesn't have a stomach. That's weird. It doesn't make any sense. In fact, it makes so little sense that the first person to kill a platypus, they taxidermied it, which was really cool. I know there's a few people in here who would love taxidermy. They taxidermy the platypus, and they brought it to the royal, catalog, or the, the royal uh, catalog in, in London, and they brought it to them, and, and they're like, here it is, the platypus. And the people s- accused them. They said, you're faking it. It's not real. <laughs> it doesn't make any sense. It's a weird animal. So where am I going with this? Well, church, there's a lot of things in life that are not going to make sense, and some of them are funny, and some of them are just not funny. But I don't want the scripture to be something that doesn't make any sense to you. I have two commitments for you. Since we're still kind of in the beginning of the year, I want to remind you of something. If you're new here, this is a great welcome to Living Hope Christian Center. I, as your pastor, am committed to not protect you from your Bible. (laughs) I'm not. I'm not going to protect you from your Bible. But I also am committed to try to make it make sense I don't want it to be confusing, but it's a two-way street, and you've got to do your part. You've got to put some heart in this. You've got to put some intelligence in this. You've got to try to come close to the Lord. And so if we can do that together, I think we should pray, and we're going to jump in. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I just thank you, God, that even though there's so many things that just don't make any sense, that the word doesn't have to be one of them. In fact, you want us to know you more. You want us to know you. You want us to have a relationship with you, which means we can't have this confusion and this vagueness and this distance. Lord, you are specific. You're a person. You're an individual that we can come to know. And when we think about this trinity, it's it's complicated, but we sense that you are personal, God. You're a creator. You're a savior. You're a comforter. So I pray as we get into the text today that those things would be in our mind, that we would think on these things today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Turn to Philippians chapter 4, if you dare. If you dare. Philippians chapter 4, there's a Bible ahead of you if you really want one. Make sure I'm not saying anything crazy. Philippians 4, if you dare. Somebody's like, is it dangerous? Is it dangerous? Yes. 
It is dangerous, man. I'll tell you, reading the scripture is dangerous. It killed me once. (laughs) You guys know what I mean? Everything about my old identity, the things that I used to be, the way that I tried to make myself, it put that old man to death, and it's good. I'm glad. There's new life in Jesus. It's the best decision I've ever made, is to take God seriously and to consider what's written. Philippians chapter 4, we're going to be starting off in the beginning. Fun thing about Philippians, I'm going to tell you a fun fact. Philippians has three I's, three P's, and only one L. And I found every possible spelling, like, wrong way to do that. I kept typing it, and I was like, oh, it should have two L's. We all know. It doesn't make any sense. Philippians 4, go to verse 1. Here's what it says. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, you whom I love and I long for, my joy and my crown, Stand firm in the Lord in this way, dear friends. I plead with Iodia and I plead with Syntyche to be of the same mind in the Lord. Yes, I ask you, my true companion, help these women since they have contended at my side in the cause of the gospel, along with Clement and the rest of my co-workers whose names are written in the book of life. Let's pause right there. You might think, you really can't get much out of that. Yes, I can. (laughs) You just watch me. Um, If you didn't catch that, and... I'm going to be honest with you, every time I read Philippians up until like two months ago, I didn't catch this. I don't know how, but I guess I'm still learning. That's probably a good thing. Do you want your pastor to keep learning? Okay, well, I'm going to be honest with you. I learned something. I didn't pick this up before. Paul is encouraging these two ladies to learn to get along and for others to even intervene to help them find peace. These were people that Paul knew, and he had heard that they were fighting They weren't getting along. And so he's commending, he's saying, come on, agree in the Lord. Have the same mind. You see, Paul isn't surprised by disagreements that are going to happen. In fact, Jesus talks about these things many times. You remember one of the disciples comes up and like, Jesus, if somebody does like a whole lot of things wrong in the same day, how many times am I going to forgive them? What was Jesus' response? Somebody. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so again, that's symbolism with numbers. Jesus is trying to say all the time. All the time. There is no limit. We're not putting an equation to this, Peter. It's all the time. And so uh, when it comes to disagreements, we expect that we're going to have disagreements. Who, just real quick, if you're brave enough, would say you are a strong-willed person? Just raise your hand nice and high. God bless your honesty. All right. (laughs) By the way, I agree with most of you. (laughs) Uh, I'm a strong-willed person. I have convictions. Sometimes a little stubborn, Rick. A little. That's what my wife tells me anyways. There are times where disagreements are going to come up between us, especially with a strong-willed people. It's going to happen. But the Lord and Paul have the same command. Make peace. Have the same mind. Agree in the Lord. Both the translations say it in a good way. You know, it's so distracting for unbelievers when they see us fight with one another. Who has met an unbeliever, somebody who's just not convinced about Jesus yet, and their first thing that they got to bring up to you is, well, Christians fight. Christians are hypocrites. Christians don't get along. Yeah, it's distracting for them. It's really hard to see the truth when they see Christians butting heads. Now, understand this. When it comes to our core beliefs that Jesus himself taught and the apostles recorded, things that deal with salvation, freedom from sin, what is sin? We're not moving on those, amen? We're not moving on those. Come on, church. I need you to be hearty with me today. We're not moving on those. Amen. We're not moving on those. Um, we can't compromise on those things because those are truth. I would rather offend somebody than sin against God. So we're not going to move on those standards. We're going to be stubborn about those things to some degree, hopefully in love, hopefully in love, hopefully careful in explaining ourselves. But when it comes to things like your methodology, your style, the color of the carpet, for goodness sakes, clearly other temporary, earthly things, we can't let our ego and our human traditions get in the way of kingdom progress. Now I need an amen on that. We can't let our human traditions and our ego and our bad personality quirks, we can't let that stop the mission God has given us. But it is our biggest threat. I told you a while back, the biggest limiting factor in your life is not me, the programs I provide, the type of church that we are. No, 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 no. The biggest limiting factor is you. It's your choice. How far do you want to seek him? How how close do you want to be with Jesus? That is a decision you get to make. Jesus isn't holding you out at a distance saying, no, I'll get a little more cleaned up first. 
a little more holy, then you can come close. He is the one who came to us when we were filthy, rotten sinners. We, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That's what the scripture says, right? So he's inviting us in. Don't give the, seat, don't give the enemy a seat at your table. Don't give them space in your heart. Don't give them a ledge to stand on or a grudge to nurse. Make peace quickly. I'm going to tell you something as your pastor. If you come to me and you say, oh, I got beef with so-and-so, the first thing I'm going to ask you is, oh, yeah, what did they say? Did you tell them or are you just telling me? I want you to make peace quickly. Now, if we get into a real big issue and I have to intervene, I'm still going to ask you, How can you make peace? It's so important that you recognize God has given you the capability to make peace. The problem is you're fighting your pride, you're fighting your ego. And that's the thing that's gonna limit you. Let's go to Philippians 4, verse 4. You guys doing okay today? Okay, I'm doing great, thanks for asking, Jesse. I'm doing awesome, doing awesome. I love this passage, I love this book, actually. I do. Go to verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. I'll say it again. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Man, that's powerful. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus you realize that that is a loaded, intelligent paragraph. Like that's getting to the human condition really well. It's speaking to things that we need like every day. You know, some of what I like about that little paragraph right there is that it's reminding us who we are becoming. Everybody say who. Who? You know, the problem is so often we focus on what we're doing. But Jesus is focusing on who you're becoming. It's a bigger picture. It's a bigger picture. You guys understand that? Who we are becoming. We've got to become people who celebrate, who are unashamed, without hesitation. We praise God in every good thing of the Lord, whether it's directly connected to us and it's our good news, or it's somebody else's blessing. If you find yourself being apathetic about God stuff or good stuff going on in other people's life in the church, that's a scary marker about who you are becoming. When you stop rejoicing and celebrating over other people's good fortune and their blessings, you are becoming apathetic. You're becoming disconnected to the living God who wants us to be able to rejoice, whether it's your good news or not. Be someone who can rejoice even when it seems like you have no earthly reason to do so. It's because you have a heavenly reason to do so. Whether you've been dealt a good hand or you're still busy eating the consequences of bad decisions, be someone. Be someone who can rejoice always. Be glad in the Lord. I like this one part where it says, he, he, he says, let your gentleness be evident to all. Everybody say gentle. gentle. So men, listen up for a second. I'm going to tell you something. Gentleness isn't a lady thing. Do you know that? In fact, gentleness is well-connected to an intelligence thing. Did you know that? Gentleness is connected to intelligence. It's kind of like how you'll see strangely intelligent animals. You ever had an animal that you're like, you are too smart? (laughs) Come on. You had that dog, that horse whatever it is, and they're just, man, you are just too smart. Strangely intelligent animals also possess the capability to be gentle. Do you understand what I'm talking about? Intelligence, gentleness. I think of uh, Coco the gorilla. Who remembers Coco the gorilla? (laughs) Do you know that Coco the gorilla had a pet kitty? They gave him a kitten. I mean, like, did that start off as an accident or something? Because that seems like a really poor decision. They're huge. They're scary. But he was gentle with the kitty. There's videos of Coco, and he gets his kitty, and he pets it in his lap, and he runs over to the corner, and the the trainers come in, and he doesn't let the trainers come to the kitty. He's gentle with the kitty. Isn't that just funny? Intelligent. Coco is one of the most intelligent, uh, I think, uh, apes or gorillas to ever uh, live. 
Dogs, who's had a dog that is like, he can be fierce but can also be gentle? He can be so gentle. You ever see a, like a, a mama pick up her pups, just real gentle on the back of the neck, and move them away, and then you come too close and they show you their teeth and they're like terrifying? But they're intelligent, they possess the ability to be gentle at the right time. Killer whales, now I'm gonna tell you something, Killer whales are on another level of intelligence. They act gentle just long enough to get in a tank with a trainer. That's, <laughs> that's smart. That's really smart. All right, I'm going to do this SeaWorld thing just long enough, and then I'm going to eat that guy's arm when I get bored. <laughs> Sorry if you lost your arm to a SeaWorld accident. Uh, gentleness. I remember one time, I'm going to tell you a story. I remember one time I found a robin's egg on the ground, and I was very young, and I was never accused of being incredibly intelligent. That never seemed to come across, but I was like a little investigator. Dale, I'm serious. I used to take my notebook out and like take field notes of things that I was investigating. I thought I was so smart, you know. I'm glad, I'm just so glad that nobody ever found that, that notebook. Uh, I found a robin's egg on the ground, and this is what I did. I was like, a robin's egg, it's on the ground. Eggs aren't supposed to be on the ground. Eggs belong to birds and dinosaurs. I'm going to wager that this one belongs to a bird. Birds put their eggs in nests. Nests are in trees, and trees have branches, and branches are up. Like I said, never accused of being intelligent, but I was right. And so I looked up, and sure enough, there's the nest. And I'm like, man, it didn't break. That's amazing. I'm going to do what every young little boy wants to do, and I'm like, I'm going to climb up there on that skinny little branch. I wasn't that delicate. I wasn't that gentle. I wasn't that intelligent, I don't think. And I, I climbed up there to go put the egg back in the nest as a little boy. And I wasn't gentle. And I, I knocked down the nest and I broke all the eggs. I think, I think there were three in there. I think. I broke them all. And I remember just being like, oh, man, that really bums me out. Can I tell you something? That, that right intentions don't equate to doing it right. You can say the right thing the wrong way and still be wrong. You can have an intention to correct a situation, but if you lack gentleness, you might end up breaking all the eggs. You might crush the potential that was there. Yeah, I'm going to share another story. Can I tell you one more? I, just, I was thinking about it. Let's check the time before I do anything crazy. Um, okay, I do have time. It's kind of an embarrassing one. One time when I was, okay, this is 13 years ago. It's a while ago, but I'm still a little embarrassed about it. Uh, the first pastor I ever served under um, in, uh, I guess, kind of an official position in the city, so it was actually in St. Louis Park, and we had a really big building, we had a gym, we had like a full gym, it was a very large facility there in St. Louis Park, and we would rent out our rooms or we would let people um, come use our rooms for free, and there was this traveling evangelist speaker type guy. And like, he gave me the, <laughs> I didn't like him very much, I'm gonna be honest with you. And so, because I was like, I don't think this guy should even be in our building, I'm gonna go sit in some of his sessions and I'm gonna listen. Now, it wasn't really for our, our people of church. We just kind of let them use the building. That's the situation. But I didn't think he should be there teaching what he was teaching. And as I sat in the session one day, I heard enough, and I was sick of it. I was upset. And so I stood up, and I was sitting towards the front, kind of awkward. I stood up, and I probably wasn't smiling, Rick. I probably didn't have a smile on my face. I got up, and I made a beeline for my pastor's office, and I went in uninvited, and I closed the door unasked, and I sat down, even though he was clearly busy, and I started telling him off a little bit. Yeah, see, that's why I'm embarrassed. You know, I doubt that he considered much of what I was saying in that moment. Because there was no gentleness or thoughtfulness or intelligence about the way I was approaching it. I don't think my pastor heard much other than how I was talking, which was condescending. I don't think he saw much other than just kind of bad body language and I was being super negative about it. I think it was hard for him to catch what I was saying and I was not being gentle with my words and I think I hurt my pastor. That makes me really sad. 
because I need to go fix it. It's my job. I'm going to go fix it. And I did the same thing I did with the eggs. I broke them. I made it worse. Now, I still to this day feel 100% sure that my sentiment was right. But without that gentleness and that accuracy from the Holy Spirit to be careful, it was missed. And we could not connect on that. So I was in error. I said the right thing, but I, I said it the wrong way. And I was still wrong. You guys understand what I'm saying? Who can relate with me now? Just raise your hand nice and high. Come on, holy people. Let's see it. So seeking to be gentle causes us to be thoughtful, intelligent, careful, prayerful, and not in a selfish or silly rush. Gentleness is often linked to effectiveness. Now you can say amen. amen. It's true. It's just true. You can harshly shout someone into doing what you want them to do, or you can inspire someone into emulating you. And the reason we take this so seriously is because of what verse 5 says, the Lord is near. That's a connector. That phrase is a connector in those statements. And it connects us to the next thought, which was don't be anxious. Don't be anxious. I got I to gotta give props to my wife real quick last night. Um, uh oh, she said, uh oh. <laughs> For real, I get, I get to do this. I'm up here, so I'm going to do it. Uh, last night, man, I was, really, I was really not in good shape for whatever reason, whatever was going on about midnight. And you know what my, my wife's first reaction was? It was calm, it was prayer. She came over and she prayed with me and she was not anxious. You practice this to the T. My wife is a good wife. If you don't know her, it's your loss. You should get to know her. Don't be anxious. Don't think, I have to fix this. I have to figure everything out. No, by prayer and petition and with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. So the passage is teaching us to trust God even when the answer is no or not yet or it's kind of what you hope for. You see, in, in following Jesus, and I need you to hear me say this, when we follow Jesus, because Christianity is a religion of people who are going somewhere Amen? We're going somewhere. We're not staying put. We're not just playing church in a little building right here. We're going somewhere. There's something happening. We're on a mission. So when you follow Jesus, when you follow him, we're trying to submit ourselves to his plan. And we're trying to change our minds to become like his mind. So rather than being anxious, we submit our request, the passage said, to God. We believe him, we trust him, and we allow for a no. It's okay for God to say no because that's the nature of our relationship. He can say no, and we're fine. We're fine, we're cool, that's not a problem. Did you notice in this passage, and this might be one of the more important theological things I'm gonna bring to you today. I wouldn't mind if you wrote it down or at least like tried to remember it. Did you notice that the text clearly, 100%, without question, teaches us to present our requests to God. Present our requests to God. Not our terms and conditions, fine print. Not our demands. We don't talk to God like that. We don't demand things of God. I know a TV preacher said demand things of God. He's wrong. He's wrong. He doesn't get it. That's not the nature of our relationship. You know, it's, it's hard for me when I have to sit down with maybe a confused believer or, or an unbeliever, and they tell me that they prayed this prayer right here. I can't tell you how many times I've heard this. God, I'll serve you if you do X, Y, and Z for me. Man, I hate to break it to you. I really do. I hate to break it to you. But you're not in a position to be negotiating with the living God who is holy, in whom there's no shadow or darkness or deceit. You're not in a place to negotiate with him about your potential faithfulness based off of you getting what you want. If my child came to me, if, if little Riley came up, she's starting to talk more like she won't stop, actually. It's true. If she came up to me and she's like, Daddy... I'm going to love you if. I'd be like, you are so spoiled. I'm taking those presents away. I'm taking those gifts away. You need to get your eyes back on me and who I am and what the nature of this relationship is. So we figured out with our kids, we should figure it out between us and God. It's not that God doesn't want to bless us. The scripture says that if you ask for, for bread, God's not going to hand you like a snake. He doesn't want to hurt you. He wants to bless you. 
but we got to figure out that it's getting our mind in line with the mind of God, the heart of God, and the plan of God. It's not the same thing as just commanding it out and speaking it for, that, that's just a silly idea. It's not how any of this works. Again, present your request to God. So, if you are the Burger King and you gotta have it your way, <laughs> you are, it's a little ad for Burger King, I get like six cents every time I say something about them. <laughs> really bad affiliate program, but I do it. Um, <laughs> if you're like the Burger King and you got to have it your way, you're going to end up like King Asa. Who knows who King Asa is? It's okay if you don't. But in the Old Testament, King Asa, he ended up, King Asa ended up relying on himself and his own vision and his own idea, and it made him anxious, and it made him untrusting in his nature, and it damaged his relationship with God. It was a huge problem for him. And then a prophet came to speak to him, and the prophet said these famous words, and I bet you've heard part of this taken out of context. There's a problem with that. We need to read it in context, because it says more. I'm going I'm to read what the prophet said. In 2 Chronicles 16, 9, the prophet said to Asa, for the eyes of the Lord range throughout the whole earth, looking for somebody who he can strengthen, whose hearts are fully committed to him. But you, Asa, you have done a foolish thing, and from now on, you're going to be at war. Man, that's consequences, right? And we know that God works through natural law consequences. You make a bad decision, sometimes you eat the fruit of it, amen? And Asa just couldn't see. He couldn't hear clearly. He had this anxious hesitation to trust God, and it burned him. And then he was also a jerk. He took the prophet and put him in prison. <laughs> that's, that's not good fruit. So we present our desires to the Lord, but we seek his plan over our own plan because it's very often our desires that have unforeseen flaws and, and, and it may be the fact that our plan wasn't a good plan after all. Has God ever told you no? Come on somebody. Has God ever told you no and it turned out it was a really good thing he said no? <laughs> yeah, that's part of the trusting relationship with God. All right, and so that takes us right up. If we do well with the last part, it takes us up to that conclusion in verse 7 Let's read verse 7 one more time. Verse 7. So if we do the first part well, it says, And the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. The peace of God. But there's kind of an if statement there. We don't have peace when we do it out of order. When we try to command God and we don't get our way, we don't have peace. So if... Who you are becoming is a person who rejoices, you're gentle, you understand God is near, and you don't have to have it your way, but you submit all your concerns and your requests to God if you're becoming that person, verse 7 applies. Some people in here, and this is not dogging on you, I'm not looking down my nose at you for a second. This applies to me as much as it applies to you. But I bet some people in this room, when you frequently struggle with peace, um, it's because you haven't understood this very well. There's a concept here. God's giving you a roadmap to peace, and it's not an emotional band-aid. It's telling you who to become like, and that's Jesus. Amen? Amen. We've got to keep going. Somebody tell me to hurry up. All right. Philippians 4. Slow down. Somebody say slow down. Do you want to eat lunch? Don't you know? Let's go to verse 8. I'm going to have to speed it up here a little bit. But verse 8, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Can somebody like, I'm okay with this. If you cut that out of your Bible, that little thing right there, and you send it to every news network in the world, <laughs> it'd be, no, it'd be cool. It'd be nice. If we had a little more positivity in the world, maybe it wouldn't feel like it's a big dumpster fire. I don't know. Whatever you have learned or received, whatever you've heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice and the God of peace will be with you. There again, there's that promise about peace. Put it into practice and the God of peace will be with you. Verse 10 
I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned, but you, you had no opportunity to show it. I'm not saying this because I'm in need, for I have learned to be content with whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need. Raise your hand if you know what it is to be in need. Come on, be honest. You've been in those places. I had ramen enough times in college. I just got a taste of it. Man, we are so filthy rich. We live such a good life. But I had ramen just enough times. My parents didn't do anything wrong, but they were like, you got to get yourself some groceries. And I'm like, hey, it's like 30 cents a pack. (laughs) (laughs) You can't have it 25 times in a row and be healthy. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in every situation, amen. Whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want, I can do all this through him who gives me strength. It's a good passage. So think on these things. That's kind of our title today. He says, he says, instead of filling our mind with anxious thoughts, Paul, Paul gives us an example of what we should fill our mind and our heart with And this is especially important because the scripture teaches us that for out of the abundance of the heart, the stuff that's alive in here, which you're full of, that's what your mouth speaks on. Some of you are like, man, I can't get a control of my tongue. It's because you don't have control of your heart. And you're chasing the wrong thing. It's in the heart that first God wants to deal with you. And the evidence that's coming out of your mouth, the things that are pouring out of your mouth, man, it'll, it'll, it'll happen. Give it time. If he can deal with the heart first, he'll get to the things coming out of your mouth. The rest of the passage here, I'm I'm not going to read because it's personal comments that Paul made. And I suggest to you, church, that you read the chapter for yourself in personal devotions tonight. I want you to think on these things. Read it all the way through. Give yourself a chance to keep processing this. We went through a lot of stuff, right? It's a lot of stuff. Keep reading. I want to encourage you with that. Uh, Normally, I do try to leave you with like a take-home point. But here's the deal. Paul covered a serious amount of territory in this passage, and I'm willing to bet that God highlighted something out of the passage today from here for you. Let me just ask real quick, did God highlight something for you today? Like something made sense. Just raise your hand. Let me see. Something made sense. God gave you something today. Amen. I'm glad to see those hands. Um, Let me challenge you with something, and I'm not going to embarrass you here. It's for you to do on your own. I want you to write it down. You know, what science tells us is that when we write things down, we are way more likely to continue thinking about it, and it's continuing to dwell in us, and we're more likely to act. Did you know that if you write your goals down, you're 90% more likely to succeed in the goals? That's wild, isn't it? And I did not make that statistic up right now. <laughs> Promise you. Really inspiring, but no, I, I, just, I just learned that at a pastor's conference recently, that people who write things down are much more likely to keep processing it and dealing with it. So I'm going to encourage you, if if God spoke to you, man, we all get these smartphones, write it in your notes. Better yet, write it on a piece of paper. If God spoke to you something useful today, if there's something on the scripture that made sense to you, I want you to write it on a piece of paper, and then you got to do the crazy thing. I want you to tape it to the mirror at home, or I want you to tape it to your steering wheel. Please keep your eyes on the road. But like when you get in the car, you know, tape it somewhere that you're going to see it. On your nightstand, in your Bible, I don't care where it is. Let God continue talking to you, because my guess is he's not done with this. I don't think it's a one-and-done thing. I I think there's more in here that God wants to keep working on us with. So let me tell you this. um, If you want some fresh inspiration from God, you've got to do something different. You've got to change it up. So take up my challenge for you this week, and uh, maybe tell me about it if you want to. You guys are really good about that. When there's a challenge or uh, a take-home point, you guys often send me a message or a text Let me know what God is doing in your life. I love that, by the way. It's so encouraging to me as a pastor to hear people who are critical, deep thinkers, who are continuing to process. I like that a lot. And I just want to remind you that victory in the kingdom of God doesn't come by holding ground. Do you understand that? Victory in the kingdom of God doesn't come by holding ground. It comes by taking ground. And it's not something you're going to do on your own. You actually need Jesus for that. So let Jesus cooperate with you with whatever he's put on your heart. And I believe he's going to give you success. Amen? Amen. Think on these things. Would you stand with me? Let's pray. We're going to 
have some pizza, some food. Around 11.30, I think, um, is when we're picking up the pizza. So just hang out for a few minutes. Go play ball in the gym. Uh, meet some people. I think these are the best people in the world. I love these people. This is my family. And I would encourage you, go meet somebody today. Make a friend today. Uh, they're real awesome people. I'll tell you who to steer clear from, and it'll be... <laughs>